Hello, welcome to Fundamentals for Startups, a Comotion Labs production. My name is Zach Chamberlain, and I'm the Labs Manager over at Flucall for the Life Science Startups. Um, if you've joined us before, you know that Comotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the UW community. If you've joined us before, sorry, we are committed to nurturing and enabling the success of our startups, contributing to critical infrastructure, and, uh, and building opportunities for learning and mentoring and networking. Um, we do all of this without taking equity or IP, and we have three incubators across campus. We have here at Startup Hall, the tech incubator. We have the hardware incubator and the life science incubator over at Fluke Hall. Um, if you're a founder and you're looking for a community to help your startup grow and flourish, we'd love to talk to you. Fundamentals for Startups is a regular lecture series open to everyone interested in learning about entrepreneurship and startups in general. Um, every week we bring experts with diverse perspectives and experiences to share insights and inspire action. Um, a few announcements before we get started. All Fundamentals for Startups are archived on YouTube on the Comotion website where you can filter by topic. Um, and to learn and register about future fundamentals, please visit Comotion Labs online and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Today, I'm excited to introduce um, Eric Shudisky, founder and CEO of S2S Public Relations. As an on-air broadcast journalist covering elections and other major stories, Eric has learned to make the most of limited airtime, capture, um, <clears throat> sorry, I lost my line deliver inspiring stories and uh, capture audiences' attention. Today, our Eric will share PR strategies and tactics that can help you validate and de-risk your startup, build awareness, and empower advocates and raise your profile. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Hi, everyone, nice to be here today. Appreciate you spending your lunch hour with us. Um, I also want to introduce Trevor, who's on our team. He's sitting here in the front row. Uh, so we'll address questions throughout. So if you're interested in asking a question, feel free to, to flag me down, raise your hand, and we'll make sure that, that we get those questions taken care of. Definitely want to have more of a conversation. So feel free to, to interject, add a point of view, very interested in what you're seeing as well from your vantage point and how it might add to or elevate the conversation that we're going to have here today. I'm going to make a quick addendum to our cover slide already, PR essentials to elevate Pacific Northwest startups, but also founders. You know, what we wanna do is make sure we're building equity, not just in the startup that you're creating, that you're laboring on, that you've spent decades or years or even months perhaps just starting this startup, but we also wanna build equity in you because those two items won't always be together. We wanna make sure that the awareness just isn't flowing through to your startup, but also to you. So when those two part ways and you perhaps IPO, acquisition, or your startup moves to a different phase and you move on, that you take that equity with you so that you can more quickly move to the next element of your life or your profession or your uh, academic endeavors. So this is a quick introduction. So that's how you spell the name that was just pronounced, Shadisky. If I have my email here, I'm very responsive. If you have a question or you're not a, a fan of asking a question in an open forum like this, feel free to just send me an email. I'm very responsive, happy to answer questions. Uh, as mentioned, I grew up as a TV news reporter, uh, had some really powerful experiences. I shook hands with the Dalai Lama, I was embedded with search and rescue during hurricanes, and I covered the president, so I have a drawer full of White House press passes. But what, what I was most interested in from a journalistic perspective was taking very complex science and making it very compelling in seven seconds or less. You know, this'll, this'll be a strange forum for me because in television, I'd work about two minutes a day. You know, I'd be on air, I'd say something, and then uh, two minutes later, I'd be done. So this, this'll be a stretch. So if we end early, you know, I'm trying to hit the word to point ratio, I may, I may do a little bit too well with that. So our focus for the firm, which is S2S PR, S2S stands for C to series or series A to series B. We primarily work with venture-backed impact technology, technologies that are trying to change the world, improve the human condition, improve the environment. We have a strong focus in life science, but also in climate technology. As a reporter, and there's some other former journalists in the room, 
If you're watching a, a newscast, listening to a podcast, reading a website, and you walk away, you're going to remember one story, maybe two, but most likely one. My job then as a reporter and now in PR is to make sure the story that we tell is a story that people remember. And there's ways that we can do that. And during the course of this conversation today, we're going to try and give you the tips and tools and techniques that you can build that foundation so people not only see and know your news, but they also trust it. Because we don't want to obsess about a press release. Press release is, is the most approachable known entity of public relations. But a press release alone, you're going to see, I, I think there's four fish bowls. I think there was a discount on, on uh, clip art, but we have a lot of fish bowls in this conversation. This is one of them. Uh, so press releases alone won't do the job you want them to do. We want people not just to read your press release, but trust your press release. And to do that, we need more than just a press release. Let's, let's welcome in our first rhetorical question of the day. So why not just a press release? Because, and, and I'm going to address journalists, but when you hear journalists, also think investor, also think partner, also think potential colleague. 60%, more than 60% of journalists, when they read a press release, will go to your social media channels. And they're going to check whether that story on the press release aligns with what they see on your LinkedIn as a CEO, on your company Twitter page, or X page, or X channel, uh, or Mastodon, or Blue Sky. Uh, and they, they're looking for weaknesses. They're kind of probing that line. You know, what is inconsistent here? What, what is a flag that I cannot trust this source? So we want to make sure that we're building consistency across all those channels, that we're building this lattice work of media, influencer, investor touch points, so that when you tell your story, it's consistent across all those different verticals. So your job, you know, for that, you know, we know that reporters, uh, when you write a story and you're in a newscast, people remember one story. If you remember one item out of this, this might make a very short presentation for you because you could probably walk out after this. But if you remember one point from this presentation, it's to own your narrative, it's to own your story. Because if you're not telling your story, someone else is, and they don't have your intentions at heart. They're not interested in your success. They're telling a story that might be counter to your, to your efforts, even if they don't mention your name. Because news is dynamic and moving and always in flux. So we want to make sure your voice is out there, adding a voice to the vision that you have for your, your startup. I'm just going to pause real briefly, fast start. Any initial questions or thoughts from the audience? We already have, we already have Andy has a microphone. OK. Through and uh, looking at the the differences between the messages across your different platforms, mm -hmm. is that something that you think you can use as a tool to kind of assess VCs when you're when you're looking at them? If is that like a good metric to? Okay, so if you're flipping that coin yeah. and you're looking at someone else's materials and you're seeing, you know, maybe the the VC principal on their LinkedIn doesn't align with the, with the firm, you know, like that. That piece, yeah, you can use this as a tool to, to vet VCs and also to do competitive research. You know, what are your competitors? Who are they? What's their message as well? But that's a, that's a good flip of the coin, and that's a good tool that, that not just journalists use, but, but others use to see, all right, how serious? I mean, it's also a gauge of seriousness uh, and intention. Like, what, what have you built, and how proud of it are you that you're willing to to evangelize that on all your, all your platforms. And there's also you know, a very key metric that everyone in this room is aware of. One in 10 startups make it. The rest iterate or evolve as they try to make it. And journalists know that too. So the hardest push for a startup this phase is to gain media attention. Because there is that in the back of every reporter's mind, there is that thought like, well, is this the one that's going to make it? And they want to champion for you, and they want to evangelize for you, and they want to believe they need to see it uh, as well. So good question. Thank you very much. All right, so our goal is beyond just a press release. Um, oh, sorry, here's, here's, the, here's what we're trying to build for you. And, and we'll get to uh, some tools to do this for you in just, uh, just a few minutes. But this strategic awareness and the T word again, trust, 
the Edelman, which is a you know, small boutique PR firm, also has a presence here in Seattle, uh, does a survey every year that's their trust barometer, and we'll get into it. But the, the most trusted media source is search. It's your Google results. It's your, if we're, we're in Seattle, so your Bing results, or your DuckDuckGo results. That's the most, most trusted of all media, beyond traditional media, beyond social media, beyond own content. It's the search results because you're cultivating that yourself. So there's a high degree of trust there. So we want to de-risk your startup, de-risk you as a founder. We often do that through data, through some publications that you might have. Validation by association, who's invested in with you, who's invested in you, who's on your leadership team, who's an advisor. And all news is driven by the first three letters of news, which is new. So what is novel? What is interesting? What hasn't been talked about before? And then the scale of impact. You know, how big is this? Is your total addressable market 1 million, 1 billion, 100 billion? That matters. How many lives do you think you might save? How many people might you protect from harm? You know, that scale matters in terms of an input for what news might be. And then something that is often underappreciated but is of high value is the founders. You know, do you have a proven track record? Is this your second or your third startup? Is this your first startup? Because there's also a value there as well. So as we've learned, PR not analogous with press release, press releases. But you know, if I were to change what that metaphor, that acronym stands for, I think it's the psychology of reputation. I think that's what we're that's what we do when we're at, working at our highest and best level as PR practitioners. We work on the psychology of reputation, and we build different touch points. Welcome to another fishbowl image. Uh, to a very robust ecosystem where wherever people look, wherever they source, they see you in the way that you want to be seen. So that's search, that's your website, that's owned media, and owned media, just as a, a quick breakdown. Um, owned media is something that you put on your blog, uh, a post that you might write on LinkedIn. Uh, and a, a quick tip that's not in the rest of the presentation that I'm just remembering now is if you, on your signature line, put a link to a LinkedIn post you think is relevant. Just say, find out more about what I'm working on. And a link to something that you think will help educate the reader and something that you want additional eyeballs on. That might be a press release, but it might be a LinkedIn post. It might be some own content as well. Media mentions matter, social content, and those partnerships and affiliations. So let's start building that ecosystem for you. But first, let's take a stop at Platitude Corner. So not only rhetorical questions, but also platitudes. And I think this is, as you're thinking about what, what might engage not just a reporter, but also an investor. You know, think about some high value items. I'll let you read this and kind of enjoy Platitude Corner for a second as I take a quick drink. Reporters don't want to be sold to. You. I have a, a friend who works at the, the New York Times and uh, we pitch him every once in a while. And his response oftentimes is, I need tension in the story. Like, this isn't marketing material. There always needs to be, at that level, there needs to be some element of conflict. There needs to be some element of, of disruption that goes beyond you know, very glowy marketing material language. So there has to be a casualty in the story. You know, sometimes you get to be the hero in that story, and that's our job, just to place you as that hero. But the story wouldn't be complete. Someone in Wichita, Kansas, wouldn't be interested if it's just a glowing piece on you. So there's always going to be, especially at higher levels, there's going to be some conflict in, in the news that you're involved in. Uh, and I say higher levels, meaning a greater audience share and more reputation in terms of uh, the, the outlet itself. So you know, when you're thinking about your messaging, when you're thinking about positioning yourself as a thought leader, the thing about having something to say is much more valuable than having something to sell. Being interesting matters. You know, there used to be, it just, it just stopped, but there, a good example of, uh, of being interesting is there used to be a CEO workout column in a, in a top tier publication. Like, what's your CEO's workout? And that is great because people want to engage with someone who feels like them, that there's some texture with the individual. Uh, and then for your company, you know, make sure you're weaving in culture to that as well, because that resonates with media. They want, they want to see something that that's perhaps has a much bigger vision than it does it has in terms of its footprint. Something we use in our practice all the time is 
zooming out to zoom in. Like, you know, we're often dealing in a very granular level in the technology that we're working on, the applications that we're producing, but to, but to just step way back and think about if you're at a Thanksgiving meal and the person next to you wasn't involved in all in your sphere, how would you explain to them what you're working on? You'd start by, you know, we're trying to save lives, we're trying to help the environment, and here's how we're doing it because X and Y. So that zoom out feature, and then zoom into what you're doing. And the more that you live your innovation, the more that you champion, the more that you talk about it, the more you're discoverable. So we wanna build that, that discoverability as well. <clears throat> and in the Pacific Northwest, we're not super great at it. We're just not. We wanna be, we think about it. If there's a continuum, and this is not, I, this is something I produce, so I'll, I'll take the accountability for it. There's, there's a humility, and I grew up in the Midwest. There's like a big humility factor there as well, where you just don't talk about your accomplishments. And then there's evangelism. There's something in the Nor Nordics called Jontelaven, which means like just let others discover you. It doesn't work if you're trying to raise money. It doesn't work if you're trying to change the world. So I'm always trying to advocate for people to live out loud, to tell their message uh, in a very public way because the discoverability factor is real. We've posted for startups who have never posted before and they have gotten in top tier CFOs, top tier CCOs, because the messaging that we've presented, you know, working with the client has created a gravity around what they do and has allowed them to be exposed to a wider audience. So, so put yourself out there, get involved. And here's just some, some interesting graphs. So this might sound good. And this is some of our media tracking software. The most that we've done in the past year in terms of Seattle and biotech, I know there's many different applications here. We work quite a bit in life sciences and climate tech, so this is just a search we did. Some months we are accountable, our firm, for 10 or 20% of, of media in this category for Seattle, um, which sounds like we're doing pretty well until you look at everybody else. Miami twice as much as us in terms of their biotech volume. So our volume is really about a two. You know, the top two, Boston and San Francisco, make a lot of sense. But Vancouver, BC, should that be more than three times in terms of coverage and volume as us? I'd advocate that perhaps not. I think we have the tools and technology and talent here that we can, we can raise the awareness much higher than it currently is. And I think in terms of, of uh, of selflessness. When you talk out loud about your technology and you're based here in the Pacific Northwest, you're helping every other startup in the Pacific Northwest because you're creating a greater, greater mass to this. Um, so in your, your VCs, especially if they're outside of the Seattle area, we'll expect that you, you engage in some awareness building. So what, what we found that does for you, you know, builds the awareness, validates de-risks, you know, things we've talked about already. Uh, but also helps your team find you. You know, those people who will help you move your, your, your work forward. So and here's, here's the first, first graph in terms of what people trust the most. So social media, far on the right there if you're looking at your screen. Search results though, more than 20 points higher than social media. And this is, this is a plus change from, from last year. So, Making sure that there's this robust discoverability will be important uh, for you in stacking those results. And this is also important when you look at not just you, but who's competing for dollars? Who's competing for eyeballs? Who's competing for attention in your space? And how do they rate? Usually before we begin engagements, we'll just screen capture search results and get a sense of like, what, what does that look like? And then how can we change that? How can we evolve that? So the messaging we want to be on those first returns shows up on those first returns. And then here's a little bit about just the methodology of that survey, so we're being transparent. So a global, global sur survey. All right, so let's build your story a little bit. There are only two stories in news, which makes it pretty easy. There's only ever the rise and only ever the fall. Everyone in this room it's the rise story. You know, it's the what is next? What are we building? How are we raising, raising awareness? How are we improving the world? Even in decline in PR, we try to tell the, 
the rise story. Layoffs to increase efficiency, as an example, or to belt tighten, or to focus on a specific innovation. But these are the two stories that, that media, media tell. So when you're thinking about your story, to think about it as an elevation story, as a growing story, as an improving story, because that's a story that, that people want to tell. And this is where news collides. This is the intersection news. And you'll have access to these slides afterwards. They can be a little dense. But this is, this is how we determine news, or this is how news is determined. So as we discussed, <coughs> excuse me, the first, first element is new. You know, the, the analogy in news is, you know, dog bites a person, not news. Person bites a dog, yeah, that's pretty newsworthy. So how do we, how do we flip it around and make it novel and new? Uh, and then mass, you can almost, this is almost a physical phenomenon. You know, the more mass you have, the greater gravity you create, the more that you draw people towards you. And that's what we want to do, create gravity around your idea, your innovation, and your team. So the size of financial deals matter. Your total addressable market matters. How big of an impact you're going to have on your world matters. How many people you're hiring, your revenue. And some element, you know, local has changed. You know, it used to be that, that, all news is local news, and it still holds true. Your news in this room will matter more to GeekWire than you know, someone innovating in Oklahoma or Miami. Uh, but beyond that, your localization is your niche. You know, is it, are you Bloomberg Climate? Are you Gen? Are you Genome Web? Is that your local? Is that your vertical? Because finding those niche publications really helps move the needle for people in their initial stages of, of growing. And the most difficult of all of the elements of news, timing. You know, how do you find that news pocket where your news is still new? Because that frontier, what is new today is old tomorrow, is constantly moving. So thinking about what is the next story to be told? What haven't people talked about? Those are really good thought exercises as you think about how you can engage with media. Let's see. All right. So, if I were to get started as a startup, here's the breakdown. Here's what we'd work on. So, review your co competition. And this isn't just on the technological front. You know, this is on you know, who else might be pitching the investors that you want to pitch. And how can you make sure that you're different, that you have a unique value. When we work with clients, we try to break, the, break those into unique value propositions. You know, what are your three or four unique value propositions that separate you, and how do you defend that? Not are you just better, but why are you better? Not just you're faster, but how are you faster? Not just that you might have more impact, but really get granular on what is that differentiation, what's that unique value? And you'll find a lot of this in your pitch deck. You know, a lot of what you're talking to investors about is what you should be circulating in a very public way as well. And then who are, who's on your team? You know, how can you make sure that you're leveraging the highest and best use of each person, even in an advisory capacity? So talk about your, your all-star team. And we want to make sure that, that you're creating uh, the touch points that allow, allow each of these to be discovered. This is the most dense slide we'll have today. So we'll just spend a little bit of time here. So stand up, refresh your website. So this is... This is where people will go as a single point of truth, your website. So clear call to action, clear value proposition, write your why statement. And I'm going to hold on why statement for just a little bit. So a why statement is something that we encourage all founders to write, 300 words. If you can get it in less, please do it in less. So 300 words about why your innovation matters, how you're changing the world. It's a vision statement, but we've seen that create the mass that founders need to get to the next financing round, to build the team that they want to build, and put that on your website. Make sure people discover it. It's also really good social collateral. So you're starting when you have your website, when you build your website, you're creating content. You're creating content that you can not just use on the website, but you can apply across social media. You can have a feedback loop to your investor deck as well. Is this great copy that would move an investor? Um, and then, as Trevor from our team says, your website is your boot camp. It should be hard. It should take time. And it should be concise. 
you know, less is more. You, you always want to look at a website and say, how can I write this in 30% fewer words? Because you want it to be quick. People will spend less than a second on a website before deciding whether to stay on a website. So how in your headline can you write five to seven words that keeps them on your website? Because you can lose them very fast. So check out your bounce rate. You know, I encourage you to wire in Google Analytics so you can see how are people bouncing, where are they navigating on your website. And I'd encourage you as a next step, after you've been through this arduous boot camp around your website and div you're dividing it into about us, our team, and then having your impact on your homepage. It can be a one-page website. But then you want to write a draft press release about your next milestone. We'll get into the anatomy of a press release uh, in a little bit. But drafting a press release about your next milestone forces you to think about how you'd convey that to a very broad audiences. And we have a question, is that right? Okay. We have a question in, um, from online and it says, I'm a solo founder working on a B2C app. Mm -hmm. I'm in the MVP stage. At yep. what stage should I go bigger on PR? Mm -hmm. I am a tech person, so PR skills are not my strength. Should right. I hire a PR company? Okay, great question. The when is a, is a really important question. So for B2C is a little bit different than B2B or fundraising. So B2C, I typically advise about, you want, you want to start PR and have it activated and moving when you're starting to collect credit card numbers when you're starting to, to sell. You want to have a ramp up to that. Uh, so you want to engage uh, a firm or the, the resources, and we actually go into you know, how you can engage with resources uh, at the end of this. But you want to engage you know, 30 to 60 days before the moment that you want to turn it on. So you can refine the messaging, because we know, especially in the consumer space, things move very fast in the decision making for a consumer on a very stereotypical level, happens very fast. So all your, all your touch points have to be very crisp. You also then need to think about how do we stand up a cadence of messaging to start driving the, the funnel, you know, driving inbound interest through the top of your funnel. So very broadly, knowing what I know, I'd say engage with a communications professional. It could be a solopreneur, uh, but engage with someone about 30, 60 days before you want to start accepting credit cards. Uh, or start accepting payments or start selling whatever you're selling in terms of the B2C space on, uh, in that space. Good. Great. Good, good question. If there's any other questions in the room or online, feel free to, to shout them out like that. We will get to some of this as well, but happy to take them in flow. Uh, so the writing the draft press release, and this is good for the B2C as well, because you're talking about a launch. You're talking about something that is new. You're talking about entering a market, disrupting a market. And those are all really powerful. The biggest news moments for startups are your funding cycles and your launch cycles. So think about, like, if, especially if you're doing your initial funding, that's going to be by far your biggest media hit. And then your next round. And then we're going to start working into positioning thought leaders for awards and speaking engagements. But between, between major announcements, that kind of trough of news, we'll work on those thought leadership uh, elements, partnerships as well, but those big moments are your funding moments, typically for a startup or your launch moments for a B2C, especially if you can work on an exclusive and happy to, to dig in how to, how to do that a little bit as well. So you're writing your draft press release, the anatomy of the press release will come in a little bit, but you're developing that message, you're refining that message, and then you're going to apply that message to your social media channels. And you can take a website and you can carve it up a dozen different ways to take little bits and start putting them on social media. The best, the best way to start is by introducing your team. If you haven't started and you're thinking about, all right, what is my first course of action? Refresh your website, talk about your team, and then feature them once a week on social to start building audience and talk about what makes them unique and what makes them a rock star in what they do. Typically, and this is a question we'll, we'll receive, like what social channels should I be on? For most people in this room, it's going to be LinkedIn. Will be the one that you should should be on, not just you as a founder, but you as uh, a startup as well, uh, or a or a company or an organization should should have both. It used to be Twitter was always the second. Now it's becoming more optional as that self destructs in its own special way. 
So, but there's also Blue Sky Mastodon. So there's other places to go, and there's some reporters who are no longer on, on X. There are some reporters who are only on X, but it's a great place to engage with investors uh, as well. So think about your different audiences. So you're not just, you don't just have journalists, but you have investors, you have potential colleagues, you have potential partners. So partners, colleagues, those people will be on LinkedIn more so than investors hunting. Investors hunting will be on X or Mastodon or Blue Sky typically. And I'd encourage you, and we'll, we'll get into some, some of this in a little bit, a lot of people in this room are the most trusted people in the world. So you have a trust factor if you're a scientist or you run a business like no one else. So to think about leveraging that trust and building that trust to engage with key influencers. And even if you target a reporter at say Bloomberg Climate or at Gem, DMing them as a founder matters and they read those and you have much more credibility than than a PR practitioner you know to be to be honest because you have an earnest desire to see yourself succeed and especially if you have a scientist uh, scientist by training you're going to come in with a high degree of credibility to that conversation and they and they they will trust you more than they trust uh, other sources so let's obsess about a press release for a little bit now that we've gotten all that taken care of so there's a story arc, um, and a press release has three elements, action, reaction, and context. What's happening is your headline, the reaction is your quote as the founder, and the context is that zoom out piece, that total addressable market. And I'm going to offer you some triggers for when to write a press release, when to engage. And you'll notice that this is press release and own content. Some items might be great for the media, but might be better for social media, it might be better for, for owned content, a blog post around a new partnership that you also use on social and direct people back to your site, completely valuable. Might not raise the element of a press release or the value that you might want to drive from a press release. Uh, so each of these could have their own treatment in terms of how you engage with that, with that, uh, that uh, announcement or trigger. So these are, these are the typical ones that we see. Patents, growth, new hires, partnerships, funding, seeking funding. We want to position you ahead of a round by talking about your innovation, talking about a patent. So we'll use some of these other triggers to help position you in the ecosystem to build awareness around your innovation for funding. Who doesn't love a list of power words? And here they are. There's, these, are these are what we like to see in press releases, and you'll see Typically about two of these in any headline for a press release. And I have two favorite in here, because what we're doing is signaling. We're signaling primarily to investors in your space. So my favorite, if I had to choose, would be uh, proprietary and non-dilutive. Because I want to build a moat around your innovation. And if there's a patent, if you have proprietary technology, you are starting to build this moat. And if you are receiving non-dilutive funding, an SBIR grant, that, that is a signal to investors that you're also probably looking at dilutive funding. So we wanna mention that there is, this, there is a communication between your press release and investors that is more subtext than text. So we wanna use these words. And this last bullet point has become critical. How are you using AI? How are you using ML? We had a reporter in a conversation who just asked, who didn't even wait for it to come up in conversation, just asked, like, so how are you using AI? It has become so present in everything that, that we produce and the media interest is so peaked that we wanna make sure that we address how you're using the latest technology to drive your innovation forward. So addressing AI or ML, uh, if you're using it in your technology is important and to leverage it, it's becoming more of a need to have versus uh, a nice to have. Um, in, certain, in certain technology landscapes. All right, this is a little bit of an autopsy. This is just very, very simply how to dissect a press release. Press releases are this, are this flow between subjective and objective statements. So this is an attention-grabbing headline. This is a press release we wrote, so if you zoom in and find uh, any errors, you can feel free to keep that on the down low. Um, this is 
Uh, attention grabbing, you'll see new in the headline if you can see that. We talk about accelerating, which is, which is always good. It's a partnership. But you want this attention grabbing headline, you know, usually less, less than 10 to 15 words is great. We use subheads a lot to unpack the, the news. I care when I write press releases, 90% about the headline. I care about 8% about the subhead. I care 3% about everything else. Because if you get someone to read the headline and then you get them to read the subhead, you've got them. So care about 90% about your headline. And then you're going to write it like a news story. You're going to write it in an ob objective fashion. So keep the object uh, adjectives at bay. But then your, your quotes, and you typically have two quotes. Your quotes are going to be where you become more subjective, where you have liberty to use some adjectives and talk about how you're positioning what's new in the frontier of what you're working on, how you're going to drive impact. It'll be a CEO quote, will be your first quote. And then your second quote would be from a VC or a third party validator, outside, largely outside your, your org structure, who can speak with some, some objective sense around what they're saying and has some strong credibility. You're going to link to your social media channels at the bottom of your press release. Uh, the areas that take the longest to write in a press release are yeah, the six words after. You, you always start with your, your startup's name. And then in the first paragraph, you start up with your startup's name. And then you have about six words that describe your startup. They're hard. They're hard to come by. You know, what, what describes you in six words? So work hard on that, and then your boilerplate is the hits, runs, and errors of what you do. When you're founded, who you're founded by, how many team members you have, where you're based, the area in which you work. So those are, those are the key elements to this. And again, on delay, you can, you can receive, these, receive these slides. So, so this is, if you're going to attempt, this is a, a good way to break it out. Uh, and you want your press release to be, um, about 600 words or less, because you really want a very tight message. We're in an attention economy right now. So the less that you uh, absorb people's time, the stronger your point will be. So you have this, another example of a headline uh, that we worked on. We talked about funding in new in this headline. Those are, those are attention grabbers. We don't mention the quantity or the, the volume of funding or the amount of the funding, because we want to put that a little bit later to drive people down. The funding amount was not exorbitant. Uh, but we want to make sure that people understood that there was funding and we're entering into this new space. And your third-party validator, quote, reaction, the total addressable market. Something else that's important to, to put in a press release is don't just hard stop. Let people know what's coming. Let them know what you can expect coming up. And an example of, of how to do that, you know, anticipating Q3 growth, uh, explore, we're exploring additional, we didn't say where, the name of company is exploring additional partnerships in this vertical. So to think about just putting that intention out there about exploring partnerships as one of the last lines in your press release will help move that forward. Uh, and there's a, a few, few tools and tips that, that I used to use as a reporter. One of them is when you come back to the newsroom, and you can use this when you come back or you get on Zoom for, for some time after you haven't talked to your team. And you're talking about your innovation. What's the first thing you talk about? What is the first thing you bring to the table? Because that's what's exciting you the most. There was, uh, there was a, a public hearing about uh, new bus routes. And the public hearing took place at noon. And it was about 18 blocks from the nearest bus route. And no one went. And come back to the newsroom and you say, no one could get to this meeting. And it was about buses, and that is your story. It's no longer about what, where will the new bus routes be. It's about the meetings in the wrong place at the wrong time trying to serve the right people. So to think about what you're telling, what you're most interested in when you're conveying a story to someone on your team, that's going to be one of the headlines that you might have. And then when you read your press release or someone else reads it, what's the first question they have? Well, how much funding did you get? How long will this partnership ask, last? And then weave that back into the press release. So, so always fact check your your press releases uh, with someone else who's not involved in your, in your ecosystem, and they'll give you some really interesting, interesting feedback. Here's a free tool that you can use to find your audience. This is SparkToro. This is a Seattle-based 
uh, startup as well. And they have a free version. It's changed a little bit just in the past week. But say we're interested in finding investors, partners, journalists covering cancer research. You enter hashtag cancer research, and it'll show you of the people who use those hashtags, what websites they visit, what social accounts do they visit, which will give you as a founder a way to find journalists writing in that space, uh, to, track, to track those, uh, those handles or find, find the content that is, that is interesting on those channels. And then you can engage with reporters who are tracking that. You can then form forming foundational relationships. So Spark Toro, uh, worth it uh, in terms of just exploring to find, do some audience discovery. And you can play around. There's a, a paid version as well. You may not have to go there. Um, here's a before and after for a headline, just to kind of show you how you can workshop um, a headline. Let's see if it's there. This, this is a real startup from, from UW, and we worked with them just on a headline. Uh, did a presentation in Elizabeth Scallion's MBA class uh, a few months ago, and this came in in an email, and, uh, and it's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, but it's missing a few elements. So hadn't, hadn't sent it yet, but we ended up sending this instead. So we're using new, which is uh, an important trigger because people want to cover new things. And we're talking about the addressable market, uh, which is huge, and it's novel, right? This is packaging waste, so it has like a novel element to it. So this is this has three key elements in it as well. And then when you engage with a reporter, you want to make sure you're engaging with the right reporter. So don't just don't just email blankly people, but find find an article they wrote where you think the next story they write should be about my technology and begin to form that relationship. There are relationships, fingers crossed, that we have, we have been cultivating for two or three years, and we're just on the verge of, of making hay out of those relationships in terms of media hits. So there's a long tail to a lot of relationships. Some stories can turn around in a few days. Many take weeks, some take years. But we'll want to, to move you to places where those stories take days as opposed to weeks. So think about your, your pitching, and you're going to be trusted when you move into that space. This is from that same Edelman survey. Scientists are so trusted, they're trusted as much as someone just like you. So 30 points higher than government leaders. This doesn't seem too out of, out of place where we are right now. But the most trusted of all sources, scientists. And then a company technical expert. CEOs, less so. So come in as a scientist who owns a business or runs a business who wants to make a change. So this is, I trust each of these to tell me about new innovations and technologies. So you have, you have some credibility coming into this equation. Let's make sure we're right. And the media landscape, investment levels, we just saw it was in stat yesterday. But investment in biotech is up for the first time last quarter in two years. It's the best it's been in two years. So we're seeing a rise in some investment levels, but we're still seeing a decline in investment in PR. We're seeing a decline in outward awareness building. So we're seeing less funding as well. So we can get funding placed in high profile. This is one we placed um, that were inaccessible two or three years ago. So you're in a really good place, even with a smaller SBIR grant, to make some really big news and to cast a wide net in terms of your awareness. Where we're going to need more work, collectively, uh, is around AI and gene-based medicines. There's a huge distrust around AI right now. And how we solve for that is greater transparency, more communication, because we're, we're really, there's a stronger resistance building to AI and enthusiasm for gene-based medicine than almost any other element out there. Green energy is, is doing pretty well. So when, if you're in AI, if that's one of your core tenements, write more about it. Write more about how you're using it in an ethical, transparent manner. And that will help serve you to get ahead of any trust issues that, that may be inherent in the reader, not in your technology, but in the reader who's reading that, that piece. So we often see, see this when we frame this as use that obstacle as your opportunity. There's an opportunity to talk more about aid, to talk more about gene-based medicine. So we're at that, that crossroads right now. 
So this is, um, I'll wrap up in about two or three minutes and leave some time for, for questions. So we're kind of rounding the corner on the, on the presentation. <clears throat> this, this works well, not just for pitching journalists, but also for talking to investors, potential colleagues. So brevity and relevance will be critical when you engage with them. So researching not just journalists, but investors in your space, making sure that they have recent coverage or interest in your, in your vertical, and then be very specific. Reporters will read, you know, the numbers are always very frightening. We'll read, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 pitches a day, depending on the level that they're at. The, that they're at. Most of them, they'll spend less than a second on. They won't even open. We're stealthy. We know when reporters open our emails, and we sometimes know how long they read them. So we can engage with them and cycle that up. But most of the time, uh, reporters will read so many pitches that, that you really have to grab them. And if you are writing from a .uw email or an email that talks about your innovation, so think about your URL, that can also be a way to up the odds of which your, your email might get opened and engaged. And don't be upset if they don't email back. All reporters, almost all, I think is about 80%, don't mind a follow-up email. So if they don't email, wait a few days, find another touch point, find another piece of collateral, and email them again. So I'd suggest building a list of about 10 or 20 journalists that would be interested in your technology, and then just trying to connect with them on social, DM them, follow them, and then send them a pitch when the time is right. But you don't want to approach hundreds of uh, individuals. So as you engage with reporters, and as a former reporter, it's, it's difficult to be a reporter now. There are people, we mentioned this in kind of the, the pre-run-up pre to our conversation today, but there are reporters who have won Pulitzer Prizes who are unemployed. There are reporters who have decades of experience who are exceptional at what they do, who are now freelancing and don't want to be. <coughs> Excuse me. LA Times laid off 115 people recently. Uh, major publications have been through rounds of layoffs. It's endemic to the journalist trade, but it's always hard. So they're working very fast. Reporters, when I was a reporter, uh, I'd have two or three beats. I'd cover crime typically, I'd cover technology, and I'd cover uh, politics, kind of my, my three main beats. Reporters today will have about eight beats. They'll cover all those things, but they'll also cover gene-based medicine and AI. Um, you get very rarely, and we just saw this with VentureBeat uh, just uh, earlier this month, but a reporter came back after a six-year hiatus, and that reporter is only covering AI. So it's, when you can get a niche reporter, it's very good to connect with them. But most reporters, not only will they have eight beats, but they also have multiple platforms. They'll write for a publication, they'll also do a podcast. So they're kind of across different dimensions of the media landscape. So to be very quick with them, and in your emails, it's very fair to use hyperlinks. So to, to hyperlink to your study, or hyperlink to your website, hyperlink to your LinkedIn post that got a ton of traction and people are engaging with. That's interesting to a reporter. And your social profile will be as well. I think these are our last fish tanks. So we can say goodbye to that in just a little bit. So bigger media coverage isn't better, and this is back to the, the niche media. You know, to find that media coverage that you believe your investors are engaging with, that you believe your influencers are engaging with, uh, and it probably isn't the New York Times. And I'm always reticent when clients come in and say, this is where I want to get placed, especially if they don't have much of a footprint. Because everything we discussed previously, 90% of startups fail. Their LinkedIn might not coordinate with their web page. You know, there's a lot of variables involved. And sometimes the coverage isn't glowing. And you could get, you could crash your website because there's so much attention coming to you. So there's a lot of variables when you try to go big too soon. We want to build that, that level, of, level of credibility. As a reporter, depending on where you are in the hierarchy of the media ecosystem, you'll look downward, not in a disparaging way, but in, in lower audience share publications to find news. So reporters at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal might look at staff. They might look at TechCrunch to find stories that could be interesting to them that they want to elevate to their platform. So to think about, you could really see a really good idea and then make reporters at, at larger publications aware of that. All right, in thinking about news, there's a news, news pocket um, 
conversation because news is only relevant for so long. It's like um, buying that avocado. You know, like I've only got like four hours to eat this before it goes bad. And, you know, news is like that avocado. You know, you only have like, you have this amount of time. So sometimes we move very, very fast because we know, we know the story arc isn't moving in a favorable direction for us. So we're always trying to get ahead of the news cycle. So finding and understanding that story arc, um, like GPU credits is a great example of that story arc where there was such a constriction on, on GPU credits uh, for, for work in AI. And then you know, we started seeing more and more conversations around that. And then the, the story moved to increased production of chips. So you have to kind of get ahead of that, that story arc in your, in your uh, conversation outreach. And then just um, so we have some transparency and should you want to work with a practitioner? And I started as a solopreneur. I have a small PR firm uh, now. So there's ways in which you can engage that are very cost effective. You can work with a solopreneur and you can find those and have resources to find those uh, through your organizations. Um, flexible, they might not have the expertise you need. Uh, they might not have the resources, but they can be flexible and they can get you started. And I think the key is just get started. There's um, how many people just by show of blinking or you can raise your hand too, um, are familiar with news wires. Okay, so, so news wires are where you'd put a media release if you wanna drive SEO. So it's, it's essentially paid, paid media because that press release will go out as you write it to hundreds of publications and create really good SEO for your website. It also gets you on the record as you want to be on the record. So you control the message completely. And it's often a first step for many startups is to talk about a new funding round, a new partnership, and get an initial press release out on a, on a newswire. And the price range there, and I, of the reputable newswires, these are the three that we typically use um, in ranked order from left to right being the most expensive and the most credible um, to, to the right being more accessible and potentially less valuable uh, in terms of number of publications you'll get in. But you saw when we talked about number of media hits, and you saw that graph with 3,000 in Seattle in one month, 100 of those could come from a newswire. So you get a lot of saturation uh, in different news sites and it helps build the credibility score for your website as well. And then if you want to think about retainers, this is like where someone's on your team and you have a team. The range for smaller boutique firms can be 2,500 up to 10 or 20,000. Big box PR firms like Edelman, 15 to 20,000 and up. You have a global reach though, you have a dedicated team. You know, you, you can play that. We on our side, S2S partners with Bioscribe, it's a Bay Area based life sciences PR firm, which gives us a deep bench into a lot of different niche uh, subject matter areas, um, and also hourly and on demand. So you don't have to sign a retainer, you can work hourly. So a lot of flexibility in that space. And there's uh, practitioners out there that, that are in your, in your subject matter area broadly that you can find and will help you kind of get that ball rolling. But I wanna encourage you uh, and hopefully have given you some of the tools to, to self-start and to have a, an informed view of the PR landscape. Uh, and to kind of keep that moving, we do have a newsletter that is just tips. So if you wanted to subscribe, you can go to our LinkedIn page and subscribe to our newsletter. And then that actually comes out next week. We do have tips and you can look at back issues as well about how you can exercise awareness building to drive your business goals and we have some time for questions. And my email's up there, so should you not want to ask in public, feel free to send me an email, and uh, I'll be around as well as Trevor afterwards uh, should you have any questions that you'd prefer just to handle one-on-one. -on -one. Hi. Hi I, there. I was curious about your regional biotech article mm -hmm. uh, statistics. I'm wondering, is it not just maybe like Pacific Northwest humble, hum, humbleness, but is it also maybe the health of the media ecosystem here? Any thoughts on that? Um, let's see. I think that's a valid point. I think it's, you know, the, so New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and others have dedicated team members here, and Reuters, um, Bloomberg. So there, there, are, there is representation for some really large publications here in Seattle. They generally will cover 
these other small startups like Microsoft and Google here locally and Amazon. So it's hard to get them to cover startups. So there's a little bit of both. I think we also aren't asking for it a lot. You know, we're also not raising our hands as much as I think we should to be counted on to have a comment or a perspective on that system. There are, I'm going to get it about right, but about 1,500 life science startups and companies in our region. We're, we're grossly underserved in terms of awareness. But I think that is a good point. So if you have a larger market, uh, like Miami, you might get outsized coverage. But biotech in Miami is the 34th largest industry in that area. So I think, I think there's some, some more investigation there. But I, I think we can be on par with Vancouver. You know, if, if, we, if we were aspirationally looking for where we could go, I think we could, we could, we could match Vancouver. Thank you, good question. What's your perspective, or how would you go about counteracting a negative news story or mm -hmm. PR about your company? Do you have an example of how negative it is? Um, it's not for my company, but yeah. for example, the Seattle Aquarium um, is building a new building about uh, re like sharks um, mm -hmm. that they're, they're doing to help repopulate sharks all over the world. But there's been some negative PR about it being a shark jail. Oh, OK. Negative PR is often counteracted by volume, you know, so you can start doing more news, right? So you're going to, you're going to try and deflate the number of, of bad media stories by doing more good media stories. There's also inviting in those critics and being very transparent about your objectives. So you, you can work to kind of build some fences, mend some fences uh, with those individuals and work with them directly. If they've ri written a negative story, oftentimes, you can reach out to them directly and say, you know, I'd like to show you a perspective that we see. Can I invite you on a Zoom tour? Can we have you down here physically? Um, and then also, there's negative media. Like, there's also, that's part of the deal sometimes. Like, you're going to get negative media once you get to a certain stage. You know, the, the fun part, oftentimes, when working with startups, is we don't get a lot of negative media. Uh, but when, as soon as you get to a certain point, it's almost a rite of passage to get negative media. And I think negative uh, is a little bit of a negative term. So, so I think there's, there's other perspectives that you can also counteract. And I think there's a, a good case for owned content there, too. Because you want to think about the search terms and what, what's being used in the negative media story, and then roll those search terms into a positive story that you own on your site. And then you populate through social media as well to kind of counteract that. Is that helpful? Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. Got it. I have a question online that says, have there been examples of startups using social media as an effective PR medium? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how do you use PR as an effective social media medium? I think it's most often by engaging with reporters and outlets directly so that they can engage with your content. And I think there's some really big wins that don't involve media hits, that don't involve articles. And sometimes that's just reporters retweeting your story to their audiences. And reporters can have 100,000 followers. So to think about how you can amplify your content by engaging directly with influencers online so that they can amplify and find interest and follow you, and that will eventually you know, those relationships pay dividends down the, down the road. So I'd, I'd say if you're looking to drive success solely on social, it's that engagement piece. And being active as a founder, huge credibility there. And you have a point of view that I think is exceptionally relevant and reporters find interesting. So there's more engagement. You have to be much more uh, on the offense around that. Uh, but it can be done for sure. Hi. Hey, uh, could you flip back to the slide about uh, AI and genomics and the distrust? Like, Wait, this one? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like you were, you were mentioning here that there's opportunities to like talk on topics mm -hmm. that, you know, like, I guess this slide made me think of um, Andreessen Horowitz. There's often articles by uh, Mark Andreessen about, you know, why people should be able to trust AI mm -hmm. and why they shouldn't be worried about it. And I was thinking about like his motivations, like, you know, yeah. is he trying to like bolster AI because they're invested in it? Or is this just an interesting, a topic that they know is interesting to people, mm -hmm. and therefore he's really just bringing attention to A16Z because 
it's useful to talk on this topic because people will read about it and then they learn about A16Z and so, you know, I don't know what she's doing, but first, you know, they're obviously a huge VC firm, right? Right. So in the case of a startup, like we could be writing a, a you know, a PR, a press release on like our funding round or a new hire. Mm. Um, but we could also be writing something like if we've got a viewpoint on that. Is yes. there any use to having, like obviously it's valuable for Mark Andreessen to talk about it because everyone, he's an authority. Yeah, his motives are. You know, but fair. like if somebody is just kind of working in the field and they've got a more, there's more of a viewpoint than mm -hmm. a authority on that. Is there any value into doing that kind of press release versus, you know, hey, we're going to raise a round of funding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how I might adjust that, the answer is yes. And how I might adjust that is, there's placed content. So taking your perspective or a perspective of this individual on AI and not just doing a press release, but taking a very curated piece of content and placing it in a publication as an opinion piece. That, that is the win, especially if you have standing in terms of academic rigor, innovation in the space, and you have a very crisp point of view around it. I think that's valuable. And you're right, source matters. Like who is telling that story? And if it's Andreessen, you know, the motives are a little clouded. You know, maybe not very clouded at all, but maybe very transparent. So having, having someone who has a little bit more impartial, impartiality to that is important. And we love, we didn't address because it, it just, we just didn't have time. But that own content piece, submitting articles to publications uh, on the opinion side is critical in thought leadership. So, so I would say yes, not a press release, but own content. And then once it publishes, putting that on your social, sending it out in a newsletter to your investor core and your influencers, and then recycling it on social you know, three or four times throughout the next year. You know, so there's, there's a value there for sure. Um, yeah, like, okay, so say you're gonna do an opinion piece. Like you talked about how you would send uh, PR releases to maybe 10 or 20 reporters mm -hmm. that you, know, you, you think you might get some traction from. Who would you send an opinion piece to? Well, you'd find, you'd find a publication. So there are others like Bloomberg accepts opinion. So you could start, you'd, you'd start, probably start with SparkToro, find who's writing on it, and then find the publications that publish. Some do not accept submitted content. Find the ones that do submitted content or accept submitted content. And then they all have criteria, 400 words or less, 200 words. Meet the criteria and then, and then source it in. So, so there's a there's a little bit more to that process, but you know that hopefully gives you enough to be somewhat dangerous there. Great. Cool. Well, that's uh, unfortunately our last question. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today, and for everyone at Commotion Labs. And again, a big thank you to Eric for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Remember, uh, next Friday at noon, we have Amy Royalty and Cody Nunn, uh, attorneys at Ryan Swanson in Cleveland PLLC, presenting U.S. Immigration Options for Foreign Talent. Sign up today, and we'll see you next week.